let's start with uh, the Taylor series. Okay. Uh, can anyone tell me the Taylor series of sine of x? Yes? Um, no. <laughs> Almost, but not, okay. It, it's hard to remember something that you learned in Calc 2. Um, Alright, if not, uh, let's see, H how would you get it though? How, how would you get it if you forgot the Taylor series? How, how would you get it? So you, you write it as like a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, so ex to the fourth. And so the basic idea of a Taylor series is like, uh, if somebody asks you what sine of 0.5 is, for example, uh, you wouldn't know. You would, uh, you would not know how to answer that without a calculator, right? And then at some point, you're like, do I really know what sine of x is if I don't know how to calculate? And uh, think about those people that lived before calculators. Uh, for them, uh, they had no clue what sine of x would be. So one of the things that they dreamed about was that uh, sine of x, if it could be just a polynomial, then it would be nice because polynomials is just multiplication and addition. You can always calculate multiplication and addition. So that, that wish uh, came to be fulfilled once Newton figured out the calculus. And so, so what, what they figured out was that, oh, sine of x, I know that it's not a polynomial because it has infinitely many zeros, right? Sine x is a, it's a, a periodic function, so at every multiple of pi, it becomes zero. So there's no way it can be a polynomial because polynomials, n degree polynomial has n zeros at most. So there's no way it can be a polynomial. However, the, the question was, what if, since it has infinitely many zeros, what if it could be an infinite degree polynomial? Good, good thought, right? Yeah, so you write it like this. And uh, rather than writing from the highest order, you, you have to start from the smallest order because the highest order doesn't exist. So you, this is the only way you, you could write it. Okay. So you write it like this, and then you have to figure out what those unknown numbers, A, B, C, D, E, are. Okay. So uh, how do you find A? Wow, I feel like you guys never have seen Taylor series, have you? Uh, you've seen Taylor series, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. How do you find A? No. Okay, that's a problem because, you know, as you know, math builds on previous classes. So all these previous classes that you took are foundation. If you don't know them, then uh, it only gets harder, okay? So here, here's how you do it. Uh, you plug in zero both sides. What would you get if you plugged in zero on the left side? Zero. What would you get if you plugged in zero on the right side? A. So what's A? Zero. Good. So that's how, that's how you get A. Okay, that's a start. Right. Now, how would you get B? Yeah, you could figure out how to get A. I, how can I expect to get B? Um, so the idea is to differentiate both sides. You differentiate both sides and you get cosine of x equal to what? What do you get if you differentiate? 1. A differentiates to? 0 because A is a constant, right? We're differentiating by x. What about bx? B. B. And then? 2 is cx, right? And then? 3dx cubed, x squared, 4ex cubed. Okay, now what? Now what do you do? Plug in zero. Plug in zero, yeah. So you get, you plug in zero. What's cosine zero? One. One, that's good. So you get one is equal to b. All right. So now you see how to do this, right? Okay. Uh, so let's say you differentiated this again, and you plugged in zero. What would you get for the value of C? Differentiate both sides again, plug in zero, what do you get for C? Zero. zero, okay? Because sine of zero is 
Well, if you differentiate again, you get negative sine x, negative sine of 0 is 0, so you get c as 0. Okay, what do you get for d? Minus 1. Minus 1. It's not minus 1. No. No. It's a test of mental math. Okay. You differentiate this twice, plug in 0. What would you get for D? Minus one third. Ah, very close, very close. Anyone else? Yes? One sixth. Negative one sixth, that's correct, right? Yeah. Right? That's because if you differentiate this again, what happens? Two comes down, right? Mm -hmm. So if you differentiate twice, you're going to end up with two, three times two times D plus 4 times 3 times e x, that, that will be the second derivative of this thing. Right? And when you plug in 0, 3 times 2 times d would be equal to negative cosine of 0. So negative cosine of 0 is negative 1. So you get uh, d equal to negative 1 sixth. Good? All right. Uh, and then you continue this. and you, you end up with the following values for A, B, C, D, E. I mean, you can plug them back in. And you see that a lot of these are 0. So the, every e, odd ones will be 0. And this will be 1. This will be negative 1 sixth. And the next one will be negative 1 over, uh, what is it? Uh, 5, 5, uh, 1 over 120. Uh, positive 1 over 120. It's easier if you use factorials. So it's really like this. Sine of x equal to x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh. So and so. That's That's it. Okay. This is a uh, sign. Okay. Uh, so here's another question. What's sine of zero point one? How would you do it? Just plug it into the just, just plug it in, right? Zero point one goes into x. You get zero point one minus one over six times zero point one cubed plus one over one twenty times zero point one to the fifth. But these, uh, sorry, zero point one. But these become so small, right? They, they become small that uh, we can just ignore them. You say we truncate it, right? We truncate the sum and, and just say, well, even that's too small. We'll just take this much, right? So what, what is 1, 6? This is a 0 0.1666. So if you have 0 0.1 cubed times this, this will be like 0 0.000166. And then you have uh, 0 0.1 minus 0 0.000. 1666, something like that, that would be like 0 0.99. 9, uh, 8, 3, 3, 3, something like that. Okay. So I would say that the answer is about this much. And I'm not, I'm not more confident than this one. Okay. So, does anyone have a calculator? Or, or you can use your uh, scientific calculator on your thing. Tell me what sign of zero point was it. Uh, by the way, you have to have it in, in radian mode because it, if it's not in, in uh, if it's in degree mode, uh, this is not true. This is only true if x is in radians. So what, what's the actual value? Sign of zero point one. Are you doing it? No, it's different. You might be in degree mode. Okay, uh, whilst somebody's working on that one, let, let's try, try to do the other one. Uh, what it's, it's, it's right. It's right? It's exactly this? 
Mm -hmm. Not what, exactly. What, what, what is it afterwards? It's, it's like zero. Oh, no, no, just a minute. 0 0.099. Yeah. OK, OK. So this should be right. I made a mistake. Uh, 0 0.0. 99833. 0 0.99833, right? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, I did it as if it's like 1 minus. So. It's not, it's 0.1 minus. So, sorry about that. Right? But, but that's what you get, 0 0.09983. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? Okay. Uh, one, one of the, the ways I'm, I'm aiming to teach this class is because uh, I know that often math majors come to this level without having any clue of what they learned in previous classes. I, I try to repeat a lot of things again, and when, you, when I do that, make sure that you look, know them, because if you don't, then you're not going to understand this class at all. Okay? So this is like a review, but make sure you know what I say. Okay? It's very important. All right, next, uh, what would be the Taylor series of cosine then? Oh, we could do the same thing again, but there's a better way. What's the better way? Huh? Take the derivative of this, right? And what would you get? X differentiates to 1. If 3 x sub cubed differentiates, 3 comes down, canceling one of the 3. Remember, 3 factorial means 3 times 2 times 1. So the 3 will get, go away, and you're going to end up with 1 over 2 factorial, right? Okay? Okay, and then, again, if you differentiate this, 5 will come down, canceling the 5. It's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 5 goes away, and you end up with 4 factorial. Um, what about e to the x? Well, this is something that you have to do all over again, but uh, uh, one nice thing is that uh, e to the x never changes. When you differentiate e to the x, it's always e to the x, right? So if you, if you did this thing, a, b, c, d thing again, and you plug in 0, differentiate, and plug in 0, differentiate, and plug in 0, every time you differentiate some, some uh, coefficient will come in front and which will later get divided when you solve. So uh, if you kind of expect that this is true, okay? Now, um, not only can you use the same kind of argument to get this uh, there's another thing that you can do, which is uh, you can verify that if you look at this right side, if you differentiate, you get the same thing. 1 differentiates to 0, x differentiates to 1, x squared 2 comes down is 1 over 1 factorial times x, which is the same as this, 1 over 1 factorial is just 1. This will become this when you differentiate, this will become this when you differentiate. So if you differentiate the right side, this becomes this, this becomes this, this becomes this, this becomes this. So you end up with the same exact series, right? So we know that this right side, so, so let, let's play a game. Let's say somebody gave you this series and didn't tell you what it is, okay? And the question is, what am I, right? So there are two things you understand. f of 0 is 1, right? f prime of x. You try to differentiate, you find that it's the same thing as before. Okay. Okay. What is this? This is a derivative with an equation. What, is it, what do you call that? If you have a derivative and then there's an equation, what do you call it? I'm asking you a very trivial question. I can't believe you can't answer it. What do you call this? This is what you, you're supposed to have taken before. What, what is it? A differential equation, right? Y prime equals to y. That's the simplest differential equation that you, you learn, right? So you, you, how do you solve this? Well, there, there are two ways. You can think of it as a linear, uh, first order linear, or you can solve it as a separable. So to, to solve it as a separable, you write it as dy over dx equals to y, and then you move the dx, dx this side, y divide, you can see you have dy over y, equals to dx, and then you integrate both sides. So if you integrate 1 over y, that's ln of y, right? 
And if you integrate x, uh, 1 dx is x plus c, so that when you integrate, you get uh, y equals to e to the x plus c, which, uh, yeah. So that, that's what you get for, for y, right? Uh, but then you have this unknown c. How do you get it? You just use this one, right? So uh, if you plug in y of 0, this is e to 0 plus c, and that has to equal to 1, right? So e to c is equal to 1. What, if, what is c? Zero, right? Yeah. E to the zeroth power is one, right? Anything to the zero power is one. So c is zero, and once you get c is equal to zero, and you plug it back in there, what do you get is y? Y is e to the x, right? Just as we, we knew, right? So that's another way to confirm that the series on the right side is in fact e to the x. Okay, I'm going really fast because I'm not really trying to teach this. This is just a review. I mean, you would need to know these kind of things to solve questions in the exam, but this by itself won't be on the exam. Uh, this is prereq, okay? Prereq. All right. Uh, so, so far this is all review. Now let me teach you the first non-trivial thing for today, which is the Euler identity. And if you start by, by plugging in ix into this x. So you, you take this equation, replace all the x's by ix. Okay? And then you get 1 plus ix, 1 over 2 factorial ix squared, 1 over 3 factorial ix cubed, ix ix to the fourth 5 factorial ix to the fifth 1 over 6 factorial ix to the sixth okay, fifth, okay and then let's just do one more 7 factorial ix to the seventh okay uh, what's i squared? Negative 1. I is the imagined number. Uh, I equals the square root of negative 1. So this will be negative 1. Right? So you're going to get uh, 1 plus ix minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. What's i cubed? i cubed is i squared times i, right? So what is that? Negative i. Negative i, right? So i cubed is negative i. So this is going to be negative 1 over 3 factorial x cubed and let's put the i afterwards. I, I want to put i afterwards. Okay. And then, what about i to the fourth power? That's i squared times i squared, one. which is negative one times negative one, which is positive one. Right? So it's going to be plus one over four factorial x to the fourth. And if you continue on, you'll see that the i to the fifth is just i. And then 1 over 6 factorial, oh, this will be minus uh, x to the 6. And then it will be minus uh, 1 over 7 factorial x to the 7th i. And so on and so on. You see where I'm going with this? Or not? If you're quick, you'll see what, what, where I'm going with this. Okay, so you're going to... Uh, let, let's gather the real parts and the imaginary parts separately. 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. These are reals. The, these are the ones that don't have i's. So this one, this one, this one. And then uh, for what, the ones with i's, I'm going to factor out the i. Okay? So you're going to get x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed uh, plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh. Okay, so what are we getting? Cosine x plus i sine x. Yes. Get it? Do 
you agree? Okay, so we just proved the following. We just proved that e to the ix equals to cosine of x plus i times sine of x. And that's called the Euler identity. Uh, now, there is a, a famous case, which is a special case of this, where you replace x by pi. So if you have e to the i pi, you get cosine of pi plus i times sine pi. What's cosine pi? Zero. Well, let's, let's try to draw the cosine graph. Make, make sure you remember the graphs of sine and cosine. That's really important. So here's 2 pi. Half of 2 pi is pi. Half of pi is pi over 2. This is 3 pi over 2. And then the graph goes from 1. It goes down like this and this. And then it, it repeats, right? And there's a, a copy of that on the left side as well. So that's the cosine. So you, using this graph, what's cosine of pi? Zero. I mean, not, not cosine of pi. Sine pi is zero. Sine pi is zero, right? So, so this is cosine of x. Uh, sine would be here's 2 pi, here's pi, here's pi over 2, here's 3 pi over 2, and you start from zero, like that. That's, yeah. That's sine. OK, so what's cosine pi? Negative 1. Negative 1, right here, right? What's sine pi? Zero, right? So we know that this is negative one. That's zero. So that uh, you have this. Oh, I mean, I can write over there, but that result is uh, so remarkable that it deserves its own space. So let me write over here. So we just have shown that e to the i pi is equal to negative 1. Okay, how many of you seen this before? Right? Where did you see it? The most beautiful question. Yes, there. yes. So if you, I mean, at least if you're a math major, you should be watching a lot of uh, math channels. And uh, you should have seen this as one, uh, like, there was one, once uh, a vote for top three most beautiful equations in math, and this was voted as one of the top, top three. And the reason for that is, uh, if you look at this equation, it has all the numbers in the history of math. I mean, you can even you can even put some something like zero here just to make it more complete. So, uh, among these numbers, pi is the oldest one because it's even in the Bible, right? Um, and then uh, it took a while for people to think about zero. Um, and the negative number. And then, the, I don't know which one came first. Maybe negative one came before zero, I don't know. But z zero came quite late. It, it took some time. And then E, uh, I think I was invented before E because, uh, yeah, I, people were trying to solve quadratic equations, so they invented I. And then only after when calculus in, was invented, they realized that they need this special number E so that derivatives can be calculated easily. <coughs> So uh, it, it just contains all the, all the numbers in the history, and they seem to, to satisfy this remarkably simple relationship. So that's why it's voted as the number one uh, most beautiful, not number one, but uh, among the, the top three most beautiful equations in math. All right. Uh, so that's, that's all their identity. But, uh, you might be wondering, this is nice, but what, what use is there? Um, so let me show you some usages. Okay. Um, all right, so suppose you have, here's a question. Suppose you have uh, integral of cosine 2x times 
cosine 2x from negative pi to pi. Okay, and and the, not only that, let's say you're also being asked Before you knew other identity, how would you do it? Um, so th this requires a trigonometry formulas. Yeah, yeah. So so one one way to do it would be cosine two x squared would be one plus cosine four x over 2. So you use this, so you replace that by this, and then do integration, and you get the answer. And for this one, you have to do u substitution with uh, u equals to sine 2x, then you can do it. So you have, you have the, these two questions, which you can do separately. Now that we know the Euler identity, we can have fun with it. Uh, so, out with this one. Instead, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to solve these two at once. Just one calculation will allow you to do both of them. Okay. Not only that, uh, yeah, so, so that's one I want to do, but, but there's one thing that you have to know, uh, which is that uh, if you have e to the i x equals to cosine x plus i sine x, what's e to the negative i x? Well, that's cosine negative x plus i times sine negative x. What's cosine of negative x? Look at the graph. Cosine x. It's cosine of x, right? So. Uh, you see that the graph folds nicely along the y-axis, right? So if you if you look at the value of cosine x and cosine negative of x, they they agree. They are the same value. So cosine of negative x is same as cosine of x. And by the way, any any function that satisfies this property is called you know it's called an even function. You heard of that, right? Okay. So cosine is an even function. Uh, but what about sine? What's sine of negative x? If you extend over here, that's the graph of sine. And if you have a value here, and then you look at the negative of that, it's over here. What do you see? One is positive, the other is negative, but they have the same magnitude, right? So what's sine of negative x? Sine x. Negative sine x, right? So for sine, the negative comes outside. If that happens, what do you call this function as? Odd function. Okay, so odd functions, negative comes out. Even functions, negative is consumed away. Uh, cosine is an even function, sine is an odd function. Uh, x squared is an even function, x cubed is an odd function. So on and so on, right? Okay. Now, the, the reason I put this on the board is because I want to add them. And if you add them, the cosine doubles, whereas these two cancel when you add them. And on the left side, you have e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. OK, so we have a nice representation of what cosine of x is. Cosine of x, according to the Euler's identity, it's e to the ix plus e to the negative ix over 2. Now, uh, you can also get the sign 
by instead of adding, you can subtract. If you subtract, if you subtract these two, then you're going to instead get e to the ix minus e to the negative ix, uh, which will cancel the cosines. That they are the same thing. So if you're going to subtract them away, whereas you have i and negative i, so it's going to double. So you have 2i times sine of x equal to this right side, 2i. 2i times sine x is this thing. And therefore, you want to divide, and you end up with this. Okay. So that's, that's a nice thing to use for us, at least. Okay. So here's the idea. Instead of having to do some to re remember some hard trick identity, which you're not going to remember anyways, right? Uh, or doing use substitution. I hope you remember how to do use substitution at least. If you if you forgot use substitution, you absolutely have to re re review it. Okay. All right. So, uh, but instead of doing that, he here's what I want to do. I just want to to say negative pi to pi of um, cosine 2x plus i sine 2x times uh, e to the 2xi plus e to the negative 2xi over 2. Okay. Now I'm, I'm actually applying two ideas at once, so you might be confused, but the one idea is kind of obvious, right? What, why am I putting this here? It's cosine x. Because that's cosine x. I kept cosine 2x, right? Yeah, I'm re replacing x by 2x. Right? So, so this is really cosine 2x. But look what these are. These, are these two problems just put in a single formula, right? See, if I took this second question, multiplied it by i, and add them together, I'm going to get this question. Which means that if you calculate this, the real part will be the answer for the cosine one, the first one, and the imaginary part of this will be the answer for the second one. Isn't that nice? Yes? I have a question. So yeah. you have one sine 2x over there, but you say you have two over here. So how did you combine them? Uh, sorry. It's like, OK, but maybe I should uh, say it a little carefully. So, so if I say this is a, and this is b, right? I'm saying that a plus i times b would be negative pi to pi cosine 2x cosine 2x dx plus negative pi to pi. This time i is multiplied to sine of 2x, right? But since the domains are the same, I can combine it into a single, single uh, integral. Right? If you put it into a single integral and factor out the cosine 2x, this is exactly what you get. Right? And then uh, what it means is that once you calculate this, the real part will be the value of a that we want, and the imaginary part will be the value of b that we want. So we're solving two questions at once. Pretty nice, right? OK, so let's continue. Uh, Oh, but I can I can rewrite this yet again. What is this? Can you simplify that? The i two x. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just again, the Euler identity is exactly this one with x being replaced by 2x. That's exactly what it is. <coughs> so now, that's going to be easy. I know some people get offended if I say easy. It is really easy compared to other things that you're going to solve in this class, okay? So when you multiply two things with the same base, the exponents add up, right? So if I have i, I times 2x plus i times 2x, what happens? You get i times 4x, because 2x plus 2x is 4x, right? 
And then i times 2x plus negative 2xi, in that case, 2x minus 2x. What's that? It cancels. It cancels, it's it gets zero, right? But what is e to the zeroth power? One. one. And I can bring the two outside, so here is one half of the integral of negative pi to pi of e to the, this time I'm going to put 4i times x plus 1 dx because I know that if you have e to something times x, how do you integrate? The reciprocal of this comes in front, right? So you end up with 1 half of 1 over 4i e to the 4ix okay. and then uh, plus x, right? If you integrate 1, you get x, right? And then you plug in pi and negative pi. Okay. So now let's try this one. What's e to the 4i pi? Ah, I, I should have uh, explained to you a little bit more about this. Uh, there, there's actually a geometric picture of this because if you have cosine comma sine, do you know the Gauss, uh, the, the complex plane? Do, do you know the complex plane? What's a complex plane? You have the real, real part as one axis, like the, the uh, x-axis, like, and the imaginary part becomes like the y-axis. So that, uh, for example, if you have one comma one, one plus two i, that's that's like one one comma two i. So every complex number becomes a point on this plane. Now, if you take that view, I think I've seen this before. What, what happens if you have, if you collect points that look like cosine x comma sine x? What's that? If you collect all the points that look like cosine x, that, that gives you the unit circle, right? Cosine x comma sine x. So, so what you end up with is, you end up with a unit circle, which is 1, 1. And this picture says that uh, the e to the i x is the complex number that corresponds to a magnitude one and phase angle, and that phase angle, it's called the, uh, I forgot what it's called, uh, it's called argument, argument. So, so angle x and length one. That's what e to the i x does, okay? Uh, and I like this because uh, if I plug in pi, what is e to the four pi i? See, if you plug in pi into x, right, that's 4 pi i. What's 4 pi in terms of radius? Just zero. Uh, not zero, but it's, 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 oh, zero angle, you mean, zero yeah, angle. Zero. It's a coterminal angle to zero, right? So you start from here, 2 pi is a full circle, right? And another full circle, right? And you're back here. So what is, what is that? That's, that's still 1, right? So this, this will be 1 equal to 1. What if you plug in negative pi? Then you get negative 4 pi i, what would that give you? Still 1. It would be still 1 because you go backwards two circles and you land at 1. So either values will be 1. And since you're subtracting the 2, what would you get out of here? You have the same value, so when you subtract, you're going to get 0. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. So I'm doing it a little fast, but uh, it's only because these are basic things uh, you should be able to do. Right, so when you plug in pi, you get 1. If you plug in negative pi, you get 1. And since you're subtracting, that gives you 0. Okay. So that goes away when you plug in the endpoints. That means you only have to do when you plug in pi and when you plug in negative pi and you have to subtract. Right? So you have 1 half pi minus negative pi. And you get what? You get pi. Okay. So we got pi. How did you do zero again? Oh, uh, all right, so, so let's just do it. I just wanted to skip a step, but I guess I should. So if I plug in, if you plug in pi, I get one, right? When you plug in pi here, you get pi. Okay, minus, when you plug in negative pi, you get you again get 1. Right? That's, that's what we figured. But this time, when you plug in negative pi, you get negative pi. Now, notice that we're subtracting, and these two are exactly the same, so it's going to cancel. This, these two will cancel. Although they, they look ridiculous, 
they are exactly the same, right? And you're subtracting so they cancel, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and therefore, you end up with just pi plus pi minus negative pi, which is 2 pi, and you divide it by 2, so it's going to be pi. Thank you. All right, good. Okay, so uh, what's the answer now? The answer is? This will be pi. How about this one? This will be 0. Because there's no, no uh, imaginary part. It's 0i. Zero, okay. zero. Okay. And then uh, you should also verify that these answers are correct by you should also verify this uh, by plugging in, uh, doing these in, in the traditional way, the way you learned in Calc 2. Okay? So see if you can get the same answer. Okay? Now, uh, so in general, this is what you'll see. In general, if you do integral from negative pi to pi of cosine of nx times cosine of nx. See, 2 was just some arbitrary number. It, you, 2 could be at, at this 3 or 4 or anything. Uh, the same exact calculation can be done, and you get the same answer, pi. You can accept that, right? Yeah. I mean, as a matter of fact, we could have just uh, uh, done the calculation with n, but you know that, that's even more confusing, so I didn't. But, you can do the same exact calculation with just generic integer n, and this is what you're going to get. And in the same way, if you do sine of nx, sine of nx, you're going to get 0. OK? So that's what we're going to get. Oh, cosine, cosine, sorry. Cosine. Oh, oh, and, and, and by the way, uh, if you do sine and x, sine and x, uh, th there's a reason why this one is zero and this one is not. This one cannot be zero because cosine squared, th this is the same thing, so it's a squared, right? That means it's never negative. In that case, uh, the area can never be zero. It has, should have a positive area, and that happens to be pi under our calculation. Here, there's actually another reason why this should be zero. This, this is a, what's called an odd function, and that's an even function. But if you multiply an odd function by an even function, what would you get? So if you, if you have a function that looks like... Oh, odd and even? Yeah. Odd. yeah. Right, right, right. So, so uh, here's, here's an odd function, right? Yeah, it, x to odd power is an odd function. If, if you multiply by an even function, uh, you get, no, no, a 3 plus 4, it's a, you get an odd function, right? So, so uh, the product of an odd function with an even function is an odd function, and odd functions have the property that if one side goes up, the other side goes down, where, where this is zero, right? So if you integrate over a symmetric domain, this is negative pi to pi, so it's a symmetric domain, right? So the left and right will cancel. That's why you get zero. So you could have actually solved this one without doing anything. You can just look at this and say, all right, that's an odd, that's an even. Therefore, when you multiply, it's an odd function. So, and this is, in fact, a symmetric domain, so it must be zero. So that, that would have been another way to get it. Okay? All right. Uh, so, but again, here, it's sine times sine, so it's sine squared, right? So uh, it's, again, some positive number. And that positive number will again be pi. And there are actually two ways to verify this. One is just do the same exact thing, except that uh, this time for the sign you will have to do uh, e to the ix minus e. So, uh, so this one, the second sign should be e to the inx minus e to the negative inx over 2i. So that's what you have to do. It's uh, only slightly more confusing. It's not too bad. Uh, but another way to do it would be that, uh, see, 
<laughs> sine and cosines are uh, different by half a phase, a, a quarter of phase, right? Yeah. If if you if you take the cosine function and you move this right by pi over four, then you end up with this function, which is the sine function, right? So, and in fact, because negative pi to pi is a full period of a sine x, and, and uh, it contains all the periods of these sine and x's, uh, when you actually integrate over this, this thing, you, the, the area of this thing should be the same thing as that one, because it's only just tilted, right? And you're, you're cutting it off so that you're, you're like taking, taking this and, and sorry. Maybe I should do it like this. You have, uh, this is a cosine, right? And if I tilt it 45 degrees, it'd be like that. Uh, but this is squared, so it's not really the graph. But what, what I'm trying to say is that if you square this and, and integrate from here to there, that's same as in a, cutting it off and pasting it over here, and then uh, I give up, right? But, but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that, that's why you get the same thing. So that's another way to think about why, why it should be, right? Okay, so uh, you get this. And then, uh, now, what if, what if the numbers are different? Now, uh, it, so that, that's like Q2. Q2. Almost the same problem, but the numbers now are different. Okay. Uh, so, so th this one here is still odd. This is even, so the product is odd. So you know that this is still going to be 0. But what's not clear is this one. Uh, so I, I do this type of questions in other videos on my YouTube channel. But uh, over there, I use the following identity. I, I use that uh, cosine of a times cosine of b equals to one half of cosine a plus b plus cosine a minus b. So if you know this formula, you can apply this to, to calculate this. That's, uh, and actually, that's not too bad if you actually know the formula. It's like, the, it's like I don't know. How, how many of you actually know this formula? Oh, wow. OK. OK, impressive. OK, you guys deserve to be called a math major. Good. All right, uh, but uh, assuming that uh, that's too hard, uh, we can actually go about doing it the other way, which is uh, you want to write this as the, uh, uh, so think of this as the real part of the, so cosine 3x plus i times sine 3x will be e to the i times 3x, right? And then you rewrite cosine 2x as uh, e to the i times 2x, plus e to the negative i times 2x over 2. But then uh, you can pull the 1 half outside. Uh, let's not do the real part. We'll, we'll just put the real parts later. Okay? Uh, put the 1 half outside. And then when you multiply these two, it's e to the i times 5x. What, what, what if we do these? This times this, what do you get? Come on, I'm asking you a simple question. This times this, what do you get? Yeah, yeah, say it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I x. E to the ix, right? Yeah. Because three x plus negative two x should be just x, right? Three x minus two x is x. Okay, so you have that, and then. Uh, that gives you one half of uh, one over five i e to the five i times five x and plus one over i e to the i x. Plug in pi and negative pi. And and then you, you look at this. Uh, what's what's e to the i 5 pi, 5 pi i. What's that? It's just pi. Uh, yeah, which is e to the i pi, which is? Negative 
negative 1, right? So you go once, twice, and then pi, right? So two loops is four pi, and then you go pi more, then you land right here. So this will be negative 1. What, what, what would you get if you did negative i5 pi? You'll get 1. Uh, not 1. It will still be here. Pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi. Backwards. Okay, so you'll be at negative 1. Right? So you get negative 1 here, negative 1 here. If they have the same values when you subtract, what do you get? 0. zero. So this one will produce 0 because both values will give you 0. How about this one? Plug in, plug in, zero again. Yeah, right. So you get zero. Uh, yes. I have a question. Yes. Why, uh, what does that arrow? What did you do in that arrow? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so real part of. So, so I have to take this calculation and cal get the real part of it. What's the real part of zero? Zero is zero plus zero i, right? Yeah. So the real part is zero. Mm -hmm. So if, if this comes out as zero, that means both of these are zero. This is the imaginary part, this one is the real part. We already knew that this will be zero, but this one also comes out as zero as well. Oh. Okay, so, okay, so the, uh, uh, Okay, so directly after q2, that thing, uh, that integral mm -hmm. should be the real part of this one. So if you take the real part of this answer, yeah. you get the answer for this one, which is now zero. The is the so the imaginary part of this would be the answer for this, which is also zero. Okay, okay, thank you. Because that's because uh, zero is equal to zero plus zero i, and then uh, the real part is zero, and the imaginary part is also zero. Okay? Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, you, you know, please, <coughs> if you have time, take some time to watch the videos where I, I do it the other way, using this, these complex uh, identities. It's not too bad. Uh, uh, actually, it could be easier than this one because like, people get freaked out when they see eyes on the exponent. They, they've never seen this, such a thing. Uh, but uh, I like this one better because uh, it kind of gives you a feel for why this should be somewhat different than the other one. So here's our conclusion. Uh, and th this is called the orthogonality relations, which is a summary. Uh, integral of negative pi to pi of cosine mx cosine nx dx is, first of all, it's pi when m and n are equal. Right? That, that's what this, this is. Okay. If the two numbers here, uh, by the way, this is called the angular frequency, right? So if the two trig functions are multiplied and their angular frequencies match, then you get a non-zero integral, okay. which must be true because this is always a positive function. That it doesn't have any choice other than to be non-zero. Okay. However, uh, if their angular frequencies don't match, just like here, and you could have just put this as m and n and did the calculation with m and n in general, and you'll see that uh, in any case, it will always be zero. So uh, this one will be zero if m and n do not match. And if you did the same thing for sines and cosines, uh, for the sines, you know, the sine of mx, sine of nx, This will again have the same property. Uh, and again, because of the thing that I could draw, this is just a, some quarter phase angle shift of this thing, so it's the same thing. Right? So this, this is again when m is equal to n, and this is when m is not equal to n. Okay. 
Okay, and number three, uh, if you integrate from negative pi to pi of sine mx cosine nx dx, you would get, what would you get? Zero. Zero, right? Why? Um, depends the odd and the even. And the yes, even yeah, uh, yeah. Odd times even is odd and you get zero. Good. These are called orthogonality relations. But this looks pretty similar to that Kronecker delta. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kronecker delta. Uh, right. I'll have to think about how they, they are related. But uh, you, you can, yeah, yeah, so, so, oh, oh, oh right, right, right. So, uh, good point, good point. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, what, what he's mentioning is there's some, some function called Kronecker called delta of m where it gives you 1 if m is 0 and 0 if m is not 0. So we can, we can make use of that to, to write the result in a simpler way. Uh, the way you write it is, uh, this can just be simply written as delta of m minus n uh, times pi. Pi times delta of n minus n. Same thing here, pi times delta of n minus n. Well, where this delta is called the chronic delta function. Yeah, good point. I, I haven't thought about that, right? Okay. Uh, so what do we do with this? Well, uh, so I, I'm going to start talking about something that that's uh, beyond the scope of this class, but uh, it, it, it will be like a story behind the story. If you, if you look at some, some complex uh, movies, they, they actually have their own world, right? And, and uh, for example, like Star Wars, if you, if you know the, the world behind the Star Wars, you can enjoy the movies a lot better, right? It's the same, same way. I can, I'm going to explain something that's beyond the scope of this class, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's going to help you understand why we're doing things that way. So. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, L2 functions. So what are L2 functions? These are functions whose square uh, can be written, uh, it, it can be calculated, and it's finite value. Okay. And uh, L2 functions can be over any interval, but let's, let's talk about L2 functions over negative pi to pi. So, so uh, if you collect all the functions, which satisfies the property that it's, it's square, is finite. This is called L2 of negative pi pi. Okay. Now, um, L2 actually happens to be a vector space as well. So L2 is a vector space. And uh, if you took 310, which I, I'm teaching 310, we just did vector spaces today. Uh, so what are some some, some requirements of being a vector space. Boson addition, scalar multiplication, and, and preservation of identity. 
Right, so you need that. That's how you verify if it's a subspace of something. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but uh, first of all, it should be uh, closed under addition, and uh, the addition should turn this into like an abelian group. Uh, but but all, all I'm saying, trying to say is that you can add two functions and uh, they're still in this space. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that if fx and gx are in L2 of this space, you can add them and you can show that this is still in here. Now, uh, if you actually tried it, uh, if you integrate the, the sum squared, uh, the sum of these two squared will be this squared plus this squared and then twice of the product of the two things. Uh, the, the first one, uh, the squares are okay because we know that they are bounded. The product will be bounded by what's called Cauchy-Schwarz equation. Inequality, Cauchy Schwarz inequality will tell you that uh, it, it's still bounded by the uh, other other things. Okay, so so that that's that's actually not. Uh, I mean, we could spend time to to actually show it, but it, it's uh, it is not an easy one. Um, you you need to solve some inequalities. Right? But but this this kind of makes sense, right? If you have a function that's uh, whose square is still a finite value, and then uh, if you have two of them, then if you add them, you will still have satisfied that. Uh, th then there's another one. You, you need to be able to do scalar multiplication because, I mean, what are vectors? It's something that has magnitude and uh, direction, right? That's how you learned in, in multivariate calculus. But uh, once you go abstract, then you can talk about infinite dimensional vector spaces. And, and this is an example of an infinite dimensional vector space. It's, uh, yeah, you, you can't even think about what the direction in that space would be. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but uh, we know that you, if you have two vectors, you can add them, right? And if you, have, if you have a vector and a scalar, you can resize them by scalar multiplication, right? So, so uh, yeah. this, this is showing that uh, it, if you take these two, two functions, although these are functions, not vectors, but if you think of them like vectors, they indeed satisfy all the properties of the vectors. That's like the amazing thing, okay? That's the amazing thing about L2. Right? And uh, uh, f times f of x will obviously be in L2. This one's easier because if you take this squared, then it's like c squared fx, so c squared be, can be brought outside. And because this is already bounded, c squared times f uh, would be already bounded. So, so you have these, and then you can check all the properties, and it satisfies all the properties that you, you think is a, is a vector space. Okay. All right, so big deal. It's a vector space. What do we get out of it? Well, think about things that you can do with vector spaces. So in R3, when you have a vector space, uh, when you have a vector space, uh, you can talk about components, right? And uh, you can talk about coordinate systems. You can talk about basis. Uh, by the way, what's a basis of a vector space? You know, basis. A very strong vector that span and is in linearly dependent. Right. Very good. Uh, you took three ten. Uh, three fifteen. Three fifteen. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's also a lower level linear algebra, right? What is that? Two hundred. Huh? Two eleven. Two eleven. Okay. How many of you took 211, M82? Okay. Over there, you you learned basis as well, right? Yeah, it's just been a while. Right, right. So, uh, basis is like uh, linearly dependent things, right? And then <coughs> it spans the entire thing. So, in R3, not only the standard unit vectors i, j, k are the basis, but you can tilt this in, in some way and, and take any three vectors that are not, not coplanar and any other vector can be written as some resizing of these vectors and adding them up. You can create the other vector. So it spans the entire space, any three. So uh, the, the natural kind of question that you, you can ask here is that, oh, uh, because if L2 space of functions is a, be, uh, is a vector space, then what's the basis? And uh, 
this was uh, well, it wasn't answered by Free in that way, but but Free came out with a result that actually says such a thing. So uh, Fourier, Joseph Free said the following: um, one cosine n x sine n x form a basis for all functions in for L2. Uh, what that means is that any function that you know that's defined from negative pi to pi, especially if, if you have a continuous function, then of course a continuous function over here will actually have a maximum and minimum, so their integral will be a finite value because it's just the area under the curve. Uh, it's, it's this function. You draw the function and you, you just have the area under the curve and because if it's continuous, it, it's, a, it's a finite thing, right? So for, for the usual continuous function that you know that's it, defined from negative pi to pi, you can rewrite it as some a0 times 1 plus summation n from 1 through infinity of a n times cosine nx plus uh, sorry I don't want to erase this plus bn sine nx and that, that is really like the basis right? how, how do you you express another vector by using basis. It's, this is called linear combination, right? Some number times that vector, some number times that vector, some number times that, that vector, you add them up and you express that function. Okay? So that's, that's what it is. Okay? That's, that's what Fourier series does. Uh, and on top of that, uh, notice that these are exactly the functions that I have here. Uh, you can see that <coughs> if you have two functions over here, if you have two vectors, so I'm going to call functions as vectors now because they're, they're indeed, it's a vector space, elements of vector spaces are vectors. So you have two vectors and you multiply them and you add them. What is that? If you have two vectors and you have individual components and you multiply and you add them, what do you get? What is that called? Come on, we know this. Linear combination? Huh? Linear combination? No, no, linear combination would be something like this. Okay. So, so you have a one vector and you have one vector and you evaluate the vector at each point that's like the values at each point is like the components, okay? So each component, each component, you multiply them, you add them. Oh, inner product. Inner product, that's what it's called, right? That's, that's how we define inner product of Um No, actually not. Uh, um, um, so in, in multivariable calculus, inner product is really the norm of the first times norm of the second times cosine of the angle between. Uh, but in abstract vector spaces, inner product is anything that satisfies the uh, bilinearity and some other properties. I can't recall right now, but it's just when, when you go abstract, then uh, you just have properties that, that you have to satisfy. But, but here, uh, this seems like a, a nice candidate for being uh, an inner product and, and actually if you take this and define it as a bi bilinear function see it's it's linear on the first component and linear on the second component and uh, you, you 
you look at all the positive uh, properties of this, you, you see that it satisfies all the properties that an inner product should have. Okay. Now, um, what actually happens is that uh, there are other linear, uh, other inner products that you can you can put in here, and the other ones look like this. You have some some extra density function p x d x. So as some some things are weighted more, they will be again satisfying all the properties of the inner product as long as p x is always positive or, or none, yeah positive. Yeah. So so that's that's something that we we are going to discuss a little later in this class. But right for now, this is like the inner product. And if you take this, then suddenly these relations have new meaning. Okay? So look at this one. This dotted with this equal to zero. What does that mean? They're orthogonal. They're orthogonal. Okay? See, uh, oh, I didn't t title that. Okay? So these up here are called orthogonality relations. Okay? Because you're basically saying that this vector times this vector, if you do the inner product, you get zero. Same thing. Uh, two distinct vectors are orthogonal. Okay. Not only that, uh, I didn't do this one, but if you do one times cosine and you integrate from negative to negative pi to pi, it's going to be zero. Because like, if you have a cosine and full, full full uh, period, it has the same amount of ups and downs, right? So if you have a cosine graph, you, you see that the, the parts that above the zero and the below the zero, they're, they're exactly the same. So if you multiply one times cosine, you integrate from negative pi to pi, you get zero. One times sine, you again get zero. Uh, of course, one times one, that's different. Uh, you get actually two pi from there. But anyways, uh, these are called orthogonal relations. Okay. Uh, so, so that's that. Uh, what it means is that not only these form a basis for L2, these form an orthogonal basis for L2. And that's quite nice because, for example, um, how would you find A0? So to find A0, what you need to do is you just have to do an inner product with 1. OK? Then cosine inner product with 1 is 0. Sine with the inner product with 1 will be 0. And you just have this, which is A0, 1, 1. Well, what is that? Uh, integral of negative pi to pi of 1 times 1 dx, because that, that's the inner product. What is that? That's uh, x pi and negative pi, right? So you get 2 pi, right? So if you do this, you get 2 pi. 2 pi a, a zero. So, so this is 2 pi, 2 pi a zero. Okay, so uh, in your textbook, which I think is too hard, uh, but every PD books are hard. Uh, this is not an easy subject. Uh, and uh, when I was preparing for this class, I was being quite ambitious, and I actually wanted to show you the proof why this is true, at least for all continuous functions. But I don't think we can we can manage to. Uh, that gets everything. So I, I'm not going to prove the fact that fx can always be written like this. That that proof, if you're curious, you can read it in the textbook. See how, how much you can follow, right? Um, however, um, I do want to say the following. Uh, so so what is fx dotted with one? That's like fx times one, right? So he, here's here's a formula that. <coughs> 
uh, we end up with. So uh, for, for f of x, a0 would be 1 over 2 pi integral negative pi to pi of f of x dx. <coughs> because that, that's exactly what this is, right? And you divide by 2 pi, you get that. And then, uh, what would a n be? Well, f of x, um, taking a product with Yeah. You take the inner product between these two, right? And what happens if you do cosine nx, inner product? You get one inner product with cosine x, which is? Zero. Sine cosine x, which is? Zero. Zero. And this with this, well, you have all kinds of n's, but only the ones that match with this n will survive, right? So you end up with a n cosine nx cosine nx, but what is cosine x? inner product cosine x, what is it? It's just pi. Pi. This, this is pi, right? So, you, you have to divide by? Uh, pi. pi. Okay, what's bn? 1 over pi, uh, integral from negative pi, pi fx sine nx. Yeah. Yes. So how come the inner product of cosine and cosine being prime? Like, uh, what is like? How come it's not zero? Like, oh, uh, I, I deleted, the, but, but let me write it. Uh, so uh, f of x equals to uh, a zero plus summation of a n cosine. Let, let's use k. So, so uh, as k goes from 1 through infinity, there should be one case where k is equal to n, right? Every time k is different from n, the inner product will be 0 because that's, it's orthogonal. But the only time that's not 0 when k actually equals to n, then what happens is that if you do fx inner product with cosine nx, this becomes... Uh, a n cosine nx comma cosine nx just like that okay and then you can bring the a n outside it gives you a n times pi and then yeah if you bring the a n outside then you get cosine nx cosine nx which is pi right and then you divide by pi and that's it that's how you get get this form. Is that good? Right. Okay. Um, so let's do an example. We just do one by one. So um, a zero is one over two pi integral from negative pi to pi of x squared plus x dx. Uh, now there, there's 
something that you should try, which is uh, uh, x is odd. So if you integrate from negative pi to pi, what would you get? If you integrate an odd function, what do you get? Zero. Zero. Okay. Yeah. So you can just get rid of this. And uh, if you have an even function like x squared, integrating from negative pi to pi is same as just integrating from 0 to pi and doubling this value. Is that the same thing? And often, uh, this leads to a simpler calculation because you end up give, plugging in 0 instead of uh, having to plug in both. So uh, you want to write this 1 over 2 pi times double of 0 to pi of x squared dx. Is that good? Yeah. You can always take the half the interval and double the result if the function is an even function. Okay. All right. These two cancel. x squared is 1 third x cubed. And then you have to plug in pi and 0. See how nice it is? Uh, 0 when you plug in you get 0. So you don't have to worry about this. You only have to worry about the, the one endpoint. So it cuts your work down by half. Okay. When pi is plugged in, this is 1 over pi times 1 third pi cubed. So pi and this one will reduce to 2, so it's 1 third pi squared. That's your a0. Okay. All right. Uh, now, you could do an and bn separately, right? Uh, <coughs> but uh, why not do it together, right? How, how do you two do it together? Mm -hmm. huh? How do you do both at once? The imaginary part of the Yeah, yeah, it's the that trick. Right? This plus i times this, right? So, an plus i times bn. Uh, by the way, you don't have to do it this way if you find the other methods easier. Uh, I have tons of videos on uh, finding Fourier series on my is, channel. Is the links like unloaded? Huh? Is the links uploaded? No, you just have to go to my channel and, and find it. Just type, type in Daniel on, you can find my channel and then type in Fourier series. Uh, if you're watching my videos for this, uh, there is only one thing that you have to be careful about. Many textbooks don't have this, rather than they have have a0 as just 1 over pi. But then this formula will have over 2 there, instead of having 2 there. Okay, So that's that's the only confusion, possible confusion. Uh, and that's why uh, people coming to my channel, watching the video, sometimes ask me, uh, your formula for a0 seems to be wrong, and it's not, I'm just having, I'm using this formula where 2 is down here. Okay. All right, uh, but anyways, for this one, uh, we can just say it's 1 over pi, we're going to go from negative pi to pi of the uh, x squared plus x, okay. and then e to the i n x. Right? That's because this is cosine, that's sine, if you multiply i cosine x, nx plus i sine nx, that's by the Euler identity, it's this one. Right? Okay. And then uh, to solve this, you have to use uh, integration by parts. How many of you know tabular integration? Nobody? Oh, okay. Tabular, yeah, tabular integration. So uh, tabular integration is... Well, you know, uh, integration by parts is not too bad. You can actually do it here. Uh, but any integration by parts can be turned into uh, done by using this method called tabular integration. So th those two are uh, 
uh, equivalent. It's just that uh, some, someone in the 80s, I forgot that Russian mathematician, looked at the tabular integration and just repackaged it into a table method. And by using tables, it's a lot, a lot easier to follow. So uh, it, it goes like this. You, uh, you know what V8 is, right? That one. Yeah. So exponential trigs, algebraic, inverse trig, and logarithms. So anything that belongs on the left is di differentiated. On the right, it's integrated when you do integration by parts. When you, so integration by parts differentiates the part, but integrates the other part, right? So to choose it, you use this, this rule. So here, it, this is algebraic and this is exponential, so this has to be integrated, this should be differentiated. So what you do is uh, you put derivative here, integral here, and there should be some alternation of signs, so, so signs must alternate. And uh, you put x squared plus x and e to the i and x, just like that. And uh, for the differentiation column, just keep differentiating. So x squared plus x, when you differentiate, you get 2x plus, two x plus one. 1. If you differentiate this, you get 2. two. When you differentiate this, zero. you get so 0. Yeah. If you hit 0, then you stop. Now, the downside of tabular is that sometimes this doesn't hit 0. In that case, you actually have to know when to stop. Uh, so that, that's like one additional requirement, but if you get used to it, you, you end up calculating much faster than the usual integrated by parts method. If you know you integrate by parts, you'll see why this is actually the same thing as uh, tab, tab, uh, the tabular is the same thing as integrated by parts. Okay, let's integrate this. Every time you integrate, this coefficient becomes in, comes in front as a reciprocal, right? This 1 over i n. And then this one will be negative 1 over n squared. You integrate again, you get negative another i n. And this will be plus, minus, plus, minus. Uh, but to extract the answer from here, you actually have to do something more, which is so. You imagine a boy throwing a stone, and it's like going problems. Uh, now, if the the last one is not zero, then you actually have to multiply them and integrate. But this is zero, so we don't have to do that. So that, that's, that's another tricky thing. If it's not zero, so some, some professors teach this, but they tell, tell the students only to use it when, when it hits zero. But for us, it's, it's good. Right? So what does that give us? It gives us that this is uh, 1 over pi uh, integral from, actually, we already integrated, so uh, x squared plus x times uh, 1 over i is negative i, so I'm going to put minus 1 over n i. Okay. And then, uh, so it's plus, 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 okay. Yeah. Then negative times negative is positive, so it's plus 2x plus 1 over n squared e to the i n x. Then 1 over i is negative i, but there's another negative. So it's plus 2i over n cubed e to the i n x. And you have to plug in pi and negative pi. OK. Uh, you know, I'm kind of having second thoughts now. Maybe just calculating a and b and separately might be a better one. But anyways, uh, let's continue. When you plug in pi here, what is, so maybe I should do this first. What's e to the i n pi? Well, this is e to the i pi to the nth power, right? 
What's e to the i pi? Negative 1 to the n pi. Yeah. And it makes sense because if you have n pi, when n is even, you're going full circle. So you always land at positive 1. If n is odd, you end up at negative 1. So it gives you negative 1. And that's exactly what this does, right? Yeah. So therefore, and same thing, uh, if you plug in e to the negative i n pi, uh, that's still the same thing as uh, negative 1 to the nth power, because uh, this is really negative 1 to the negative nth power, but it's the same thing. When it's even, it gives you 1. When it's odd, it gives you negative 1. So that's what you need when you calculate pi and negative pi. So let's see. If you plug in pi, you get uh, negative pi squared minus pi over n i negative 1 to the nth power. And then if you plug in pi, you get uh, 2 pi plus 1 over n squared and then negative 1 to the nth power. And then when you plug in pi, it gives you uh, just 2i over n cubed of negative 1 to the nth power. Okay. Uh, but then you have to subtract, you know, let's, let's just subtract the, the corresponding terms. Okay. So if you plug in negative pi, this is again negative pi squared plus pi over n i negative 1 to the nth power. Uh, this will be negative 2 pi plus 1 over n squared negative 1 to the nth power. And then this will be 2i over n cubed negative 1 to the nth power. OK, so all I did was I plugged in negative pi. So everything that has x's in there would, would have negative pi plugged in. And uh, thankfully, a lot of terms cancel. So this one cancels because they're, they look exactly the same. Right? Uh, this one with this one will cancel because they're, they have, they're both pluses, whereas this one will, will double. Uh, these two will cancel, but this one will double. Okay. All right. That was hard. Okay. So if you look, this is what you're getting. You get 1 over pi. This doubles, so it's negative 2 pi over n, negative 1 to the nth power i. And I want to put i afterwards because that way I can easily track which one's uh, the imagined part, which one's the, the real part. And then uh, you have 2 pi, actually 4 pi over n squared uh, plus negative 1 to the nth power. Okay. And thankfully, there's 1 over pi canceling both of the pi's. So this is the real part. So you have 4 over n squared negative 1 to the nth power plus negative 2 over n negative 1 to the nth power times i. So what is this one? This one is a n, right? And this one is p n. All right. Uh, so we're not done yet. Uh, What's the Fourier series? So Fourier series is actually this series here. We actually have to write, write this series down. So the final answer, uh, let me just erase this. The final answer would be that x squared plus x is uh, one third pi squared plus summation from n from 1 through infinity of the a n's are 4 over n squared negative 1 to the nth power cosine n x plus uh, negative 2 over n negative 1 to the nth power sine of n x. Okay? So that's what we have. Uh, but what does this mean? 
Well, uh, earlier on today, we talked about the Taylor series, right? And how do you make use of the Taylor series? If you want the approximate value of a function, you can truncate the Taylor series at some point and you get the approximate value that way, right? That's how we figured out sine of 0 0.1. And I actually got the same answer as the calculator, although I messed up the, the initial calculation, but it's, it's almost the same, right? Um, this is, again, the same spirit. Uh, if you have the graph of x squared plus x, and if you take this graph, of course, I can't do the infinite series in the computer, but suppose you, you took like uh, 100 terms of this and, and compare the two. This one will be like something like, uh, here's negative pi, so, so graph <coughs> looks something like this. So that, that's the, this graph, but if you took this graph and if you truncated it at some hundred terms or something, you, because these are sines and cosines, they, they won't be exactly the same. They're going to have some wiggles, but it will look something like this, some, some approximation with wiggles. And if you take like thousand terms, these two will be indistinguishable. It will be like basically the same thing. Uh, so, uh, you might still be wondering, well, Taylor series seem to be pretty good. Uh, it has some uses. You can uh, calculate values without relying on the calculator. What would you use this for, you might ask, right? Uh, but uh, the strange thing is, uh, without this, we don't have modern uh, entertainment systems. So, uh, for example, MP3 players, what do they do? Uh, you know, when, when you record something, all your signals are waves, right? And what you do is you take this and you, you take the Fourier series of it, and then you truncate the Fourier series. It turns out that uh, because when n is really high, those are high pitches that we don't hear anyways, right? Uh, you can truncate this at a sufficiently high frequency and nobody will know. It, it will just sound basically the same thing. Okay? Only uh, like little babies might be able to high, uh, listen to high pitches and, and see the difference, but we wouldn't know, okay? And uh, the result is that uh, if you convert an audio signal using Fourier series, you compress it by a 10 to 1 ratio. So uh, a CD has about 650 megabytes. Uh, an entire CD can be turned into MP3 and it will only be 65 megabytes. And not only that, uh, J JPEG, you know that format, right? JPEG format. Uh, it's a two-dimensional Fourier series. You, you take the Fourier series this way and this way, and you only record the, the lower frequencies, and then uh, some of the higher resolution details might be lost, but still it's good enough. And uh, that's, that's how you're able to uh, do FaceTime, because I mean, videos take a really high amount of data, uh, and without these uh, kind of... Uh, compression techniques. Well, videos have this plus some other additional techniques, but uh, you, the modern entertainment system relies on a lot of these uh, compression technologies uh, to reduce the amount of data that pa that's passed from your, your cell tower to your, your cell phone so you can watch your TikTok videos and laugh. Um, but uh, it, it, it's enabled by the, this, this free series. So that's like the great thing about this. Okay? It's, this is at the heart of all these, uh, these uh, compression methods. And it works because although if you truncate these two are not exactly the same, it's good enough for approximation. That's what it is. Okay? Uh, now in this class, we're going to use free series for solving differential equations. And uh, uh, 
if, if you have differential equations, uh, we will have to use until infinity, and we are going to treat them as equal. Okay? So we're just expressing a function in a different format. That's what's going to happen. OK, well, seems like we, we learned a lot of things today, but I still have to teach you a few more things, and we're done. Okay? Um, so I have to now talk about free cosine series and free sine series. Oh, and then and also in, in general, uh, general uh, intervals. So, okay. So Fourier series. on negative L to L. Uh, in that case, A0 would be 1 over 2L integral from negative, negative L to L. And uh, AN would be 1 over L negative L to L f of x times cosine, and here's where, where it gets slightly complicated, but it's not too bad. It's like n pi over L x dx. And uh, here, what, what it's doing is, uh, if, you, if you have cosine of x, and you, you put pi in, in there, if you put in pi, what happens to the graph? Compared to cosine of x and cosine pi x, what happens to the graph? Huh? What happens? A shift. Yeah, yeah, say it, say it. Squished. Squished, thank you. Yeah, it, it gets compressed by pi, right? And then, what if you divide by L? So, see, cosine pi x, it, it has a period from negative pi to pi, right? Cosine, this is one full period of the cosine, right? If you compress it by pi, the interval now becomes negative 1 to 1, right? And now you divide by L, you stretch by L. From negative, from negative L to L. So that's why this, this is needed, okay? So what, so what it's doing is, by squishing it by pi and dividing it by L, by stretching it by L, you're adapting these uh, orthogonal functions, the cosines and sines and even... One. one doesn't do anything, it's just, it's a constant one, so if you, even if you resize it, it's the same, still the same thing, but you're adapting these functions to this new interval, negative L to L. And uh, of course, uh, you should still try to find the orthogonality relations and, and figure out what to divide by, but uh, instead of pi, you're going to see that you, you end up with L. Uh, So, so these are uh, the, the functions for, uh, the, the formulas for uh, Fourier series from negative L to L. Because, you, you know, uh, you don't always expect a function to be defined exactly from negative pi to pi. You might have a function from negative L to L. In that case, you use this formula. And your function f of x would then be a0 plus summation n from 1 through infinity of a n cosine n pi over Lx plus bn sine n pi over Lx. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't have uh, time to give you this example, but we, we will eventually have to do something like that when we solve uh, a differential equation later, okay? Uh, and now, Fourier cosine series on 0 to L. Uh, this time, you think of a function, you 
is defined on 0 to L. And what you can do is, that means you have some function here from 0 to L. Okay. Uh, that's not good for us because uh, we only know how to do it for symmetric domains, right? Uh, we only have formulas for that. So what you do is you just fill in the other parts that you don't know. How, how should we fill in this other part? Make it an even function. So you, you just take it and you reflect it over here and you, you complete it as like that. Okay. So you force it to be an even function. Okay. So if you have a function from 0 to L, you force it to be an even function. Now, uh, if that's true, then A0 can now be integrated from negative L to L of F, uh, and let's put a hat here. Oh, I don't like hats. Uh, let's put a bar here. I don't like bar either, but let's just step. Meaning that this, this is an extension of this other function, okay? All right. Uh, so if this is even, what trick have you learned? If it's even. Then it's 1 over L, 0 to L. Yeah. Right, you, you can integrate over half the domain, and you can double the result, right? But, but look at what we have. We, if we... If we double the integral, uh, you see something at... In, something happening additional to the, just this. See, you're only evaluating the function from 0 to L, right? Then you don't need any extension, right? So you can think of this F as just the original F, because we don't need the extended value here, okay? And then, what would be A n in the same manner? 2 over L 0 to L, f of x, cosine n pi over L dx. Right. And here's another question. What would B and D? Yeah. Would it be 2L? And um, actually, I'm not completely sure. Would it be the same, but uh, if sine is n? No. <laughs> what do you think Bn would be? Zero. Why? Because it's an even function. It's, so it's an even function. So if you have fx, which is an even function, mm -hmm. this would be an odd function. Mm -hmm. And what would happen if you integrate? Even times odd is? Odd. odd. So if you integrate, you get? Zero. Zero. Okay, <laughs> and you get the following result. You get f of x, well, the extended one should equal to a0 for summation n equals to 1 through infinity of a n cosine n pi over l x. Right? There won't be any b n's, so you only have cosines, right? Uh, and this is still valid. But this, is, this will be only valid from 0 to L. You, you, you know what I'm saying? This, this will be actually true. So, so for example, uh, let's say f of x is x. And you calculated this. Okay. Now, all the functions on the right side is even, and this is odd, so something doesn't make sense, right? But it's okay, because this x would be same with the, the, the values you obtained, they will only be agreeing on the right side. The left side will be totally different, okay? Uh, but uh, sometimes this is needed. Sometimes you want to approximate your functions only using the cosines, okay? Now, uh, in the same way, there's a Fourier sine series. And in this case, 
you extend fx is extended as an odd function uh, me meaning that I, I take this right side and, <coughs> and not only you flip it this way but you flip it one more time here in that case you get an odd function So this will be an odd function. One side goes up, the other side goes down. So if you, if you extend it like that, then again, you can do the same thing. Oh, by the way, this time more things will be zero. Which ones will be zero here? A. A will be zero. A zero and A n both will be zero, but B n will be doubled, right? So in this case, you're just going to have B n is equal to 2 over L, zero to L of f of x, dx. Okay? And then the function would be defined as, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, summation from n from 1 to infinity of bn sine n pi over lx. So that, that's going to be called the sine series, obviously, because it only has sines. Okay? There's no cosines at all because you extended it as an odd function. And again, when you interpret this result, uh, it doesn't mean that fx on the right side is equal from negative L to L. It's only equal from 0 to L. Okay? You have to be careful. Okay? Okay. So uh, we don't have uh, time for any examples of this. So tomorrow, I will uh, start with an example of a cosine series and sine series. and. Uh, uh, using that, uh, we're going to talk more about uh, PDEs. But there's one, one more subject we have to learn before we actually get to the, the harder problem. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay. All right. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask me after class. Uh, this is everything for today.